welcome to the 28th lecture of this course. So, till so far we have uh, studied several models of computation and the last model of computation that we were looking at was uh, that of Turing machines. Okay. So, Turing machines are a model of computation where we have a finite control and uh, together with the finite control we have a tape which is unbounded and uh, any cell of the tape can be accessed at any point during the computation. Okay. So, just to recall let me uh, state uh, some of the classes related to Turing machine. So, we have the class of all decidable languages. Okay. So, these are uh, as I said also known as uh, recursive languages. Okay. So, decidable languages are those languages for which there is a halting Turing machine that accepts that language. Okay. So, we saw the definition last time and uh, a super class of decidable languages are uh, what are known as Turing recognizable languages. Okay. So, this is also known as recursively um, enumerable languages. Okay. So, and for Turing recognizable languages, we say that a language is Turing recognizable language, if there is a Turing machine that accepts that language. In other words, uh, for strings which are in the language, the Turing machine halts and accepts. For strings that are outside the language, the Turing machine can either halt and reject or it can go into an infinite loop. So, that is the distinction between the two and that decidable languages are a uh, subset of Turing recognizable languages. Okay. So, what we are going to see today is uh, we are going to look at other variants of Turing machine. Okay. So, so the first vari variant that we are going to study is what are known as multi tape. Turing machines. Okay. So, when we define Turing machine, we said that it is uh, a computational model which has uh, a finite state and one tape, but what if instead of one tape I have two tapes or three tapes or some k number of tapes. How is it any extra powerful or is it uh, the same as that of Turing machine. Okay. So, we have uh, finite control. Okay, so, this is the finite control and there are several tapes. So, this is tape 1 and then let us say we have a second tape and so on. Let us say there are k tapes. And because we have k many tapes, there are k many tape heads. Okay. So, every tape has its own input head. Uh, yeah. So, for this tape may be the tape head is pointing to this cell. Okay. For the next tape may be it is pointing somewhere here, may be the first cell and for the kth tape may be it is pointing some cell here. Okay. So, there are other tape heads also. So, each tape head uh, has a different tape head and each tape head is capable of pointing to any cell of that respective tape. So, what we claim is that uh, 
K tape tearing machine is equivalent to a one tape tearing machine. Okay. So, what is the reason? So, the idea is okay, we simulate the K tapes via a single tape okay. and how do we do that? So, suppose tape 1 contains the string uh, let us say some w 1. Okay. So, this is the non blank portion of tape 1. So, beyond this it is all blanks and maybe tape 2 has non blank portion from here to here and maybe the kth tape has some non blank portion up to here. Okay. So, let us give some names to these strings. So, at any step let us say that this string is some uh, maybe y 1, this string is uh, y 2, and this is some y k. So, each of the tapes whatever string is uh, there on that tape I will call it uh, y i for the ith tape. Now, what I do is that uh, here is the idea of my one tape. So, here is the one tape Turing machine. So, what the one tape Turing machine will store is it will store a concatenation of the y i's. Okay. So, it will store the contents of all the tapes. Okay. So, basically it will have y 1, then it will have y 2 and then it will have y 3 and so on and finally, it will have y k. Okay. So, basically whatever are the contents of each of these tapes, I will just concatenate them and uh, store in my uh, one tape Turing machine. Okay. So, this is essentially the idea. Now, the idea is to implement this. Okay. How do I implement this? So, suppose if there are any operations that is taking place in tape 1, I will perform that operation over here. If there is any operation taking place in tape k, I will essentially perform that in this portion and so on. Okay. So, everything is fine, but uh, if you actually think about it a little more, if you try to implement this there, uh, we run into two problems. Okay. So, the first problem is what if the string that is there in tape 1 uh, increases in length. Okay. So, so far I have a string which is let us say occupying cells from here till here. Okay. What if I add one more symbol? It can very well happen that it replaces a blank symbol with a new symbol. So, what if we that string increases in length or for example, tape 2 whatever string is there in tape 2 increases in length. Because if you look here, here there is no more place for uh, any increase. Okay. So, let me call this as challenges. So, number 1 is uh, increase in length of string on a tape. Okay. So, this is problem 1. The second problem is now, here uh, for every tape we had a different tape head, but in a single tape Turing machine I cannot have k different heads. right? So, this only contains one head. So, if that head points to the cell of tape 1, I have lost the information about uh, where the head of tape 2 was pointing or tape 3 or tape k, okay, because this is only one tape head. Okay. So, 
multiple tape heads. Okay, so, these are two challenges. So, how do we take care of the challenges? So, let us look at the first challenge. So, to take care of the first channel, uh, challenge, what we do is that if there is an increase in the length of y 1, I just push all the contents from y 2 onwards up to y k by one cell. Okay. So, if let us say I add an extra symbol over here, I push y 2, y k every uh, y 2, y 3 all the way up to y k one step to the right to create an extra cell for y 1. So, if a symbol needs to be added for y i, then push y i plus 1 all the way up to y k 1 cell to the right. Okay, so, you push everything 1 cell to the right. So, that takes care of the first challenge. What about the second, second challenge? How do we handle multiple tape heads? So, what we do is that for every symbol A belonging to gamma, add a symbol, let us call it A bar. Okay. So, what we do is that to represent what is the position of the tape head in a particular uh, uh, tape, we will replace the symbol of that cell with the corresponding uh, bar symbol. Okay. So, for example, let us say that uh, here I had the tape head pointing to this cell and this contained let us say a symbol B. In this case, let us say this contains a symbol uh, maybe A and here let us say it contains a symbol uh, let us say c. Okay. So, in the case of y 1, I have my b over here, in the case of y 2, I have a over here and in the case of y k, let us say I have c over here. Okay. And uh, of course, there are other there are other symbols to the left and right. So, what we do is that here we replace B with B bar, we replace A with A bar and we replace C with C bar. Okay. So, this will tell us what is the position of the tape head. Now, suppose if the tape head in tape 1 moves from this cell to the cell left of it, we will change this back to B and replace the symbol that is to the left of this cell with its corresponding barred symbol. Okay. So, use this symbol to keep track of the tape head. Okay. So, that is all. So, this uh, settles the complexity of multi tape Turing machines. So, multi tape Turing machines are equivalent in power to one tape Turing machines in terms of the class of languages that they accept. Now, let us look at uh, the following. So, we know that push down automaton is basically a uh, finite control with one stack. What if we have uh, a two stack machine? Okay. So, 
basically we have a finite control and you can assume this is deterministic, it does not matter and together with it we have two stacks. So, this is stack 1 and stack 2. So, what is the complexity of uh, this, uh, this model of computation? So, first of all observe that if I have two stacks, I can of course, think of a stack as a tape. Okay. It is just that it is a special type of tape, where addition and deletion happens only at one end, it cannot happen at the middle. So, I can think of it as a tape. So, it is of course, a subclass of two tape Turing machine and uh, because we showed that uh, k tape is no more powerful than one tape therefore uh, two stack machines are a subclass of one tape turing machines okay but what about the other direction whatever i can do with one tape can i do with uh, two stacks so, the answer is yes, okay. this shows that they are equivalent. So, to look at the other direction, consider the following. Okay. So, let us say I have a one tape Turing machine. So, I have my control, finite control and let us say this is the state of the tape and maybe this is the cell to which the input points to. Okay. So, let us say that this portion of my string is u okay, from here to here and uh, this portion is v. Okay. This portion is v. So, suppose I have a one tape Turing machine like this. What I will do is that I will simulate this using a two stack, two, two stack machine in the following manner. So, suppose this is u, I store u on the stack okay, such that uh, this symbol, okay, so this is the symbol let us call it uh, some a i. So, a i is at the top of the stack. Okay, so, let me say this is a 1, this is a i and maybe this is a i plus 1 up to a k. Okay. Okay. So, I store u over here a i and a 1 in stack 1 and in the second stack I store v such that a i plus 1 is stored at the top, then I have a i plus 2 and so on till a k. Okay. So, this is basically u and this is basically v reverse. Okay. So, now what I have is that, so basically whatever is there to the left of the tape, uh, left of the head is in one stack and whatever is to the right of the input head is in the other, other stack. And now, suppose if I want to replace this symbol with some other symbol and move left or right. I will just do accordingly over here. So, if I want to move uh, left, then basically I just pick up, I first of all I replace a i plus 1 with whatever symbol that is necessary. I pop out a i from uh, stack 1 and push it on to stack 2. Similarly, if I want to replace a i 1, a i plus 1 with something and move right, what I do is that I pop out a i plus 1 and push whatever I want to replace a i plus 1 with on the first stack. Okay. So, basically I always uh, maintain the invariant that uh, the cell whatever the whatever is the content of the cell to which the tape head points to is the topmost element of the second stack that is the invariant that I always maintain and this will allow me to simulate uh, 
a Turing machine using two stacks. Okay. So, this shows that two stack machine is equivalent to a Turing machine. Okay. So, let us look at one more uh, model. This is the Q model. Okay. So, I have a finite control and uh, together with the finite control, I have a Q instead of a tape. Okay. So, this is the front of the Q and this is the back of the Q. And I can add an element only to the back of the Q that is known as the NQ operation. So, I am not going to go through this. So, what is known is that once again that Q machine is equivalent to a Turing machine. And the idea is that see what you can easily show is that a Q machine is actually or one can simulate a Q using two stacks. Okay. So, basically whenever I have a Q, I uh, can simulate it using uh, the help of two stacks. Okay. So, suppose if I want to suppose uh, the back of the queue is where I push. So, 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 if I store the queue on one stack, okay, if I want to remove something from the queue which is at the very end, what I do is that I pop out everything from the queue and use the second stack to store it. Okay. So, I pop out everything and store it over here in reverse order, remove the last element and then push everything back to the first. Uh, first stack. Okay. So, it is like if you have a pile of dishes and if you want to remove the first uh, the top the bottom most dish, what you do is that you keep on removing the dish one after the other and create a second pile of dishes until only the last dish remains. Now, you remove the last dish and again replace the pile back. Okay. So, you again replace it back where it was. So, that is essentially the idea. So, now let us look at another uh, very important model in terms of Turing machine that is um, the subject of today's lecture that is non deterministic Turing machine. Okay. So, think of a configuration of a Turing machine. So, what do we have in a configuration of a Turing machine? So, if you look at the configuration of a Turing machine. So, it has three things. So, it has the current state, it has the, the current tape contents and it has the position of the tape head. Okay. So, we have a state Q and uh, in the tape basically I am pointing to a particular cell. So, if we have a deterministic Turing machine, the transition of a deterministic Turing machine is as follows. So, the transition was you from a state comma symbol pair. Okay. So, if you are at a particular state and if you are pointing to some symbol, okay, let us give it a name A, then it goes to a unique tuple. So, it replaces Q with you go from Q to a unique state, you replace A with a unique symbol and you go either left or right. Okay. So, this is a deterministic move. In a non-deterministic Turing machine, okay, so let me write it here. In 
a non deterministic Turing machine, one can have multiple transitions from a given configuration. Okay. So, basically the transition function will be of the following form. Okay. So, here is the transition function. So, it will be a function which from a q comma uh, symbol pair. So, from a state comma symbol pair it goes to the power set of q cross gamma cross L comma R. Okay. So, there are multiple transitions. So, for example, from so suppose this is a configuration. Okay. So, let us we will actually talk more about configurations in our uh, next lecture, but let me give you an idea. So, let us say this is a configuration. Okay. So, from here it can go to several other configurations. Okay. So, in this case it is going to three different configurations. Okay. So, let us call it C 2, maybe C 3 and C 4. So, yeah. so, this is what is known as a non deterministic Turing machine. So, basically in every step of the computation, the machine can non deterministically decide to do uh, 0 or more different transitions. Okay. So, it can um, do several things. So, let us look at an example and uh, we will stop after we see the example. So, here is a simple problem. So, we are given a Turing machine, uh, we are given a we, we want to solve the problem. So, the following language which consists of strings of the form 0 to the power uh, t, where t is a composite number. Okay. So, how do we solve this? So, of course, we can solve this uh, deterministically also. I just check whether a number is prime, but let us try to do this in a non deterministic manner. So, first what we do is that we first non deterministically write down two things. We write down uh, write down a uh, let us say n 1 number of zeros and n 2 number of ones. Okay. Now, check if n 1 times n 2 is equal to t. Okay. If yes, then accept else reject. Okay. So, observe that a number is composite if it has two factors. Okay. So, when I say n 1 and n 2, let us assume that uh, uh, both n 1 and n 2 are greater than or equal to 2 and strictly less than t, okay. because they should not uh, 1 and t should not be factors. So, we have these two numbers. So, if I have a number which is a product of uh, two such numbers, okay, then we say it is composite, hence we accept it and this check can be easily done using a Turing machine. So, we use non determinism to guess these two. Okay. So, write down, so n 1 and n 2, I just use non determinism to 
find out how many zeros and how many ones should I write. Okay. Okay, so here I will just say non deterministically. And uh, as it is the case with all non-deterministic algorithms, if I have a non-deterministic algorithm, I will accept an input if there is some accepting path and I will reject the input if all paths lead to reject. So, if a number is composite, it will have some two factors, hence there will be some accepting path. But if the number is not composite, that if it is prime, uh, it does not, it should not have any factors, any proper factors. Hence, no matter what n 1 and n 2 I guess, it will always lead to reject. Hence, I will not have any uh, accepting computation. Okay. So, this is an example. Okay, so, I will stop here. Thank you.